Jensen Huang just delivered a crazy keynote at Computex, and I'm convinced that Wall Street does not understand NVIDIA. NVIDIA is now bigger than Apple, and the stock has more than tripled over the last year alone, so it's easy to assume that this has to be the top. But the key to finding great stocks is understanding a company's products, not just their profits. And after this keynote, I'm convinced that NVIDIA will top the charts as the biggest company on Earth. Let me show you why. Your time is valuable, so let's get right into it. First things first, I'm not here to hold you hostage. Here's everything I'm going to talk about up front. I'll highlight NVIDIA's new Rubin GPUs, which launch in 2026. I'll break down NVIDIA's Inference Microservices, or NIMS, for AI model deployment. And then I'll cover NVIDIA Omniverse, their platform for digital twins and simulations at massive scales. And of course, what all of this means for NVIDIA stock as a result. But let me point out a few quick things before I dive into NVIDIA's brand new GPUs. First, NVIDIA is not just a hardware company. They're an end-to-end -end AI computing platform. And NVIDIA's earnings presentation has a slide that shows how everything fits together. When NVIDIA announces a new architecture like Hopper, Blackwell, or now Rubin, it actually includes five things. The GPU itself, a CPU, a data processing unit or DPU, chip-to-chip -chip switches like NVLink, and rack-to-rack -rack networking solutions like InfiniBand or Spectrum X. That's the bottom layer of NVIDIA's stack. NVIDIA's CUDA ecosystem and acceleration libraries sit on top of that. At a high level, this part of the stack enables accelerated computing across different markets from chip design and gene sequencing to physics simulations, graphics processing, and of course, generative AI. But part of that acceleration process is rewriting different software functions and operations that run sequentially on a CPU so that they can work in parallel on GPUs. NVIDIA's Inference Microservices, or NIMS, is one way they're starting to monetize this part of the stack. And the top layer of the stack is NVIDIA's AI software suites and applications, like ACE, their avatar cloud engine, which lets game developers use generative AI models to power in-game characters. These applications actually stitch together different microservices, those NIMS, to do things like understand and produce speech, match a character's lips and facial expressions to what they're saying, follow a specific set of rules and guardrails, and that's just for digital avatars. NVIDIA also has software for training and controlling robots called Isaac, or self-driving cars via NVIDIA Drive, or modeling and simulating weather patterns in Earth 2. NVIDIA's Omniverse is the real-time, physics-based 3D environment for many of these applications. So as I walk you through Rubin, NIMS, and the Omniverse, the big takeaway is that they're all connected, and improvements or innovations in any one of them also improve everything they touch. This is a big reason that NVIDIA can move so fast, and why it's so important to understand a company's products, not just their profits. And what better product to start with than NVIDIA's newly announced Rubin GPUs, which are named after Vera Rubin, an astronomer whose work provided evidence for the existence of dark matter. During NVIDIA's keynote at Computex, Jensen actually announced three different GPUs. Hopper platform, of course, was the most successful data center processor probably in history. However, Blackwell is here, and every single platform, as you'll notice, are several things. You've got the CPU, you have the GPU, you have NVLink, you have the NIC, and you have the switch. Every single generation, as you'll see, is not just the GPU, but it's the entire platform. We build the entire platform. We integrate the entire platform into an AI factory supercomputer. However, then we disaggregate it and offer it to the world. Well, Blackwell is here. Next year is Blackwell Ultra. Just as we had H100 and H200, it'll probably you know, see some pretty exciting new generation from us for Blackwell Ultra. Well, this is the very first time that this next click has been made. We have code names in our company, and uh, we try to keep them very secret. Uh, oftentimes, uh, most of the employees don't even know. But our next generation platform is called Rubin. So we have the Rubin platform, and one year later, we have the Rubin um, Ultra platform. All of these chips that I'm showing you here are all in full development. 100% of them. And the rhythm is one year at the limits of technology, all 100% architecturally compatible. So this is, this is basically what NVIDIA is building and all of the richness of software on top of it. There are a few important things to understand about NVIDIA's hardware roadmap through 2027. 
First, everything is architecturally compatible, which means any software written for Hopper will also work on Blackwell and Rubin GPUs, so NVIDIA's customers aren't starting from scratch with every new generation of chips. They're also backward compatible, which means older chips benefit whenever NVIDIA or their customers write a new acceleration library or software application, which means the whole NVIDIA hardware ecosystem gets better over time. Let me give you a concrete example. Last fall, NVIDIA came out with an open source software package called Tensor RT LLM, which literally doubled the inference performance for large language models running on NVIDIA's GPUs. That means that the tens of thousands of H100s bought by companies like Amazon, Google, Microsoft, Meta, OpenAI, and X got twice as good at running large language models for their users overnight. But Tensor RT LLM also works on NVIDIA's Lovelace GPUs, their Ampere A100s, which predate the H100s, and it'll work on their Blackwell chips as well. So the software compatibility between GPU generations is a huge deal. Second, just like the Blackwell B100 trays are drop-in replacements to the current H100 trays, it seems like the Rubin R100 trays will have the same form factor. So as more data centers buy Hopper and Blackwell systems today, they're already on the upgrade path to the Rubin GPU platform over time. And third, NVIDIA is coming for AMD and Intel's data center market share by introducing Ethernet-based solutions for the data centers that are too invested to adopt InfiniBand. Ethernet focuses on connecting client devices like smartphones, laptops, and desktops to servers inside of data centers. That's that client-server connection. On the other hand, InfiniBand focuses on GPU-to-GPU -GPU communications to solve data center scale problems by breaking them up into chunks, sending each chunk out to a different chip, returning the solutions from each chip, and then stitching those partial solutions back together. So while Ethernet speeds are all about high average bandwidth to download games or stream HD movies, InfiniBand speed is measured by how fast the slowest partial product gets returned, since we need every chunk to find the solution, kind of like a puzzle needs every piece. So NVIDIA is rolling out Spectrum X Ethernet solutions to connect tens of thousands of GPUs in 2024, hundreds of thousands of GPUs in 2025, and millions of GPUs in 2026, which could be much more common than you think. The days of millions of GPU data centers are coming. And the reason for that is very simple. Of course, we want to train much larger models, but very importantly, in the future, almost every interaction you have with the internet or with a computer will likely have a generative AI running in the cloud somewhere. And that generative AI is working with you, interacting with you, generating videos or images or text or maybe a digital human. And so you're interacting with your computer almost all the time. And there's always a generative AI connected to that. Some of it is on-prem, some of it is on your device, and a lot of it could be in the cloud. These generative AIs will also do a lot of reasoning capability. Instead of just one-shot answers, they might iterate on answers so that it improves the quality of the answer before they give it to you. And so the amount of generation we're going to do in the future is going to be extraordinary. So it's not just about larger AI models or personal AI co-pilots. Today, we think about generative AI the same way we think about Ethernet, one person interacting with one AI model to get a result. But in the future, the internet could be much more like InfiniBand, where many specialized AIs work on different parts of a problem and their outputs get combined to deliver the final answer to the user, which is exactly where NIMS come in. NIMS stands for NVIDIA Inference Microservices. Think of NIMS as AI models in a box, along with a bunch of other things to make the model run quickly, securely, and on different hardware configurations. I got invited to NVIDIA GTC a few months ago, and they showcased a lot of software at the conference. I spent my time there learning as much as I can about this part of the business, from interviewing NVIDIA's executives to attending dozens of expert panels and live demos, everything I think Wall Street analysts will ignore because it's not hardware. And I still only scratch the surface of what NIMS can do. So instead of wasting your precious time by trying to explain everything that I saw, I used that knowledge to find the best clip I could of Jensen putting it all together. And now we have a new factory, a new computer. And what we will run on top of this is a new type of software. And we call it NIMS, NVIDIA Inference Microservices. And this NIM 
is a pre-trained model. It's an AI. But the, co the computing stack that runs AIs are insanely complex. And it's incredibly complex because the models are large, billions to trillions of parameters. It doesn't run on just one computer. It runs on multiple computers. And so we realized that this is incredibly complex for most companies to do. So what we did was we created this AI in a box, and it containers an incredible amount of software. Inside this container is CUDA, CUDNN, TensorRT. It has management services and hooks so that you can monitor your AIs. It has common APIs. When you download this, you have an AI, and you can chat with it like ChatGPT. All of the software is now integrated. 400 dependencies all integrated into one. And of course, as you know, we now have the ability to create large language models and pre-trained models of all kinds. And we, we have all of these various versions, whether it's language-based or vision-based or imaging-based. or We have versions that are available for healthcare, digital biology, semantic retrieval called RAGS, vision languages, all kinds of different languages. And the way that you use it is connecting these microservices into large applications. The main takeaway here is that all AI models have weights and guardrails and feedback systems. And since all AI models are still software, they also have tons of dependencies, they need a compiler and a standardized API, they need a way to accept updates and optimizations, and so on. And because most frontier models don't fit on a single chip, the actual configuration of the network matters, since that affects how long it takes for the last partial solution to come back, just like we talked about earlier. NVIDIA is going to manage all these things through NIMS. And going back to the slide from their earnings presentation, NIMS are a part of NVIDIA AI Enterprise, which I believe costs $4,500 per GPU per year, or $1 per GPU per hour. And I think that many companies will end up paying this, because the alternative is spending internal time, money, and people on figuring out, deploying, and maintaining all of these things themselves, for every AI model, from scratch. But the true power of NIMS isn't about keeping one AI model up to date. It's about stitching many NIMS together, which leads us right into the top layer of NVIDIA's stack. And the way that you use it is connecting these microservices into large applications. One of the most important applications in the coming future, of course, is customer service agents. Uh, customer service for retail, for uh, quick service foods, financial services, insurance. And so these, one, these boxes that you see are basically NIMS. Some of the NIMS are reasoning agents. Given a task, figure out what the mission is, break it down into a plan. Some of the NIMS retrieve information. Some of the NIMS uh, do SQL queries. And so all of these NIMS are experts that are now assembled as a team. So what's happening? The application layer has been changed. What used to be applications written with instructions are now applications that are assembling teams, assembling teams of AIs. So this isn't just about building AI customer service agents. Think of NIMS as building blocks made of specialized AIs that each do one thing very well, like transcribing speech to text and text to speech, translating between languages, animating facial expressions and lip movements based on the right words and inflections, transforming product information into 3D motion graphics, simulating how light interacts with different surfaces like skin and clothing, simulating cameras and radars and lidars for self-driving cars, and so on. So just like NVIDIA builds data center systems but can sell the individual building blocks like the GPUs, the CPUs, and the networking solutions, NVIDIA also has lots of software platforms, but they can sell the individual NIMS as building blocks as well. But there's one more software platform in particular that you should know about, and that's NVIDIA's Omniverse. No, not the metaverse. People actually like this one. Omniverse is a 3D simulation platform that lets artists, designers, engineers, and researchers collaborate in a shared virtual space. It can connect to many other professional design tools and software packages across a wide variety of industries. So for example, a scene that was storyboarded in Adobe can be populated with 3D models made in SolidWorks, 
or a 3D asset can be designed in CAD and then placed in a scene in Unreal Engine. That means that NVIDIA's Omniverse will benefit from network effects in a big way. First, as more companies join up, there's more incentive for third-party creators and designers to make new modules and assets for others to download. Second, as NVIDIA's NIMS and software packages get better, the Omniverse gets more capable as well. And third, as any of these third-party design tools and software packages get better over time, the Omniverse benefits there too. But translating assets between different 3D software applications is just the tip of the iceberg. Companies can put these assets together to create digital twins at massive scales. For example, creating a digital twin of a factory would let a company simulate different layouts to see which one has the highest output before ever breaking ground, or building a digital twin of a robotic warehouse to understand what robots would see based on their sensors and how they would adapt their routes to different situations, or in the case of self-driving cars, seeing what kind of data each sensor produces in a wide variety of traffic scenarios and updating the right NIMS accordingly. NVIDIA's Drive platform is built on top of Omniverse specifically to simulate, train, and test self-driving technologies before bringing them into the real world. And NVIDIA's Isaac platform is a similar idea except for simulating, testing, and training robots instead of cars. And now we've come full circle. Because even though each of NVIDIA's software platforms looks like it's for a different application, they're all built on the same foundation of physics-based simulation, graphics processing, and artificial intelligence, which can be broken down into different acceleration libraries, software packages, and now NIMS, that are powered by NVIDIA's CPUs, GPUs, and networking solutions. That's how everything fits together, and why upgrades and innovations in any one part of the stack makes all of NVIDIA's offerings better. Also, notice that most of NVIDIA's offerings are actually software, not hardware. I strongly suspect that Wall Street analysts are so focused on NVIDIA's data center hardware that they're completely discounting the other layers of this stack. So let's talk about what all this stuff from Jensen's crazy keynote at Computex 2024 means for NVIDIA going forward. And if you feel I've earned it, consider hitting the like button and subscribing to the channel. That really helps me out and it lets me know to put out more deep dives like this. Thanks, and with that out of the way, let's talk about NVIDIA's stock. At the time of this recording, NVIDIA has a bigger market cap than Apple. And I personally believe that NVIDIA will be bigger than Microsoft by the end of the year for all of the reasons that I explained in this video and in many videos over the last three years. We now know NVIDIA's hardware roadmap for the next four years, Blackwell this year and Blackwell Ultra in 2025, followed by Rubin and Rubin Ultra in 2026 and 2027. And NVIDIA is expanding into Ethernet-based data centers with Spectrum X, which will connect tens of thousands of GPUs in 2024, hundreds of thousands of GPUs in 2025, and millions of GPUs in 2026 and beyond. And we also know that NVIDIA has a lot of software that they've built on top of that hardware, and they're still in the very early innings of rolling out their inference microservices, or NIMS, as well as the Omniverse, which supports a ton of other software platforms like Isaac for Robots, Drive for Autonomous Vehicles, and Ace for Human Avatars. And that's not even including their gaming segment, which includes their consumer-grade GeForce GPUs today. And there are rumors that NVIDIA might make ARM-based CPUs for Microsoft's AI PCs starting in 2025. Whether or not that specific rumor pans out, my point is that NVIDIA has a lot of room to grow into their existing markets, and a lot of new markets that they can grow into as well. In fact, their own earnings slides point out what they see as a trillion dollar per year opportunity, with a big chunk of that going to software, not just hardware. So for me, this is a long-term investment. I've been buying Nvidia stock well before the split, and I'll be buying it long after the split as well. And if the stock drops by 10, 20, or even 50% from here, that just means that I'll be buying even more shares at an even better price. And this is why it's so important to understand the science behind the stocks. Thanks for watching, and until next time, this is Ticker Symbol U. My name is Alex, reminding you that the best investment you can make is in you.